Hello and welcome to ESC Live. We're here at Totnes Weir today and we're delighted to be joined by Year Nines at Paynton Academy. Thank you so much for joining the live stream. Um, so today you're going to be learning about hydroelectricity. We are here in front of this fantastic Archimedes screw turbine. So hydroelectricity is all about generating electricity from moving water and you've learned about this a little bit already in your previous lesson. Um, you've got worksheets to fill in, please fill in those as you go along and please send us your questions. So we're delighted to be able to ask your questions live to the experts. Now uh, let's do some very very quick introductions. I'm Dr Natalie Whitehead, uh, I am a physicist I have a PhD in physics, but I used to be an engineer as well. I work alongside my colleague, Dr. Alice Mills, who has a PhD in astrophysics, and she's helping uh, along with this uh, project today. And we are both co-founders and co-directors of the Exeter Science Centre. We are joined today by some inspiring engineers and renewable energy experts, um, and you're going to be meeting them throughout the event and asking their qu your questions directly to them. Uh, and we're also working alongside our fantastic colleague, Professor Adam Feldman, who uh, is also co-presenting the event today. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Natalie. My name's Dr. Professor Adam Feldman from the University of Exeter. I teach renewable energy engineering to students at the Cornwall campus of the university. Now, what are we going to look at today? We're going to look at the Totnes Weir Community Renewable Energy Project here. We're going to find out all about Archimedes Screw hydro turbines. We're going to find out how they work. And once we've done that, I'm going to set you a small challenge to do some calculating, some real engineering physics. And then, after that, we'll run through the solutions to the problem, and we'll talk a little bit about becoming an engineer and what it involves, because it's such an amazing career to go into, full of excitement. So next, I'm going to pass over to Alice, who's going to be talking with Sally. Hello! Hello! Um, so I'm here with Dr Sari Morrell-Smith, who is the Operations Director of the Totnes Renewable Energy Society, which is really exciting. Hi Sally, thank you for joining us. So, um, so yeah, first of all, can you just tell us a bit about this community energy project and about Tresoc? That'd be lovely. So Tresoc is a community energy company, specifically for Totnes. We have 550 local community share offer, uh, community shareholders uh, or members and 94% of them live within 10 miles of Totnes. We're really a very, very local company. Um, we finance our renewable energy projects through community share offers. So anyone who lives locally can become a member and buy a share. We have 47 solar photovoltaic um, uh, installations on uh, a mixture between domestic and commercial properties. The commercial ones are on community buildings such as uh, Follerton Community Centre, Leedside Doctor Surgery. So then that low cost, energy, uh, low cost electricity um, it, it is being sold to those people at, at this discounted rate which further helps the community purpose. Um, we also have shares in Tronis Weir Hydro and um, Tresoc were invited to become involved uh, in the project by Dart Renewables, uh, specifically for the community engagement and the marketing side of things. I really love this project because um, I live in Totnes and it was great to see something happen locally. Um, but it ticks all the boxes in terms of uh, environmental, social and economic benefits for the local, for the community. Um, and the, we, the state-of-the-art Lanier Fish Pass was put in um, uh, as part of the development, which has really helped fish migration upstream. Uh, in terms of the uh, social side of things, we have, um, they installed a swimming and canoe platform um, uh, for local people to have better access to the river. And also economically, the uh, electricity generated here is sold at a discounted rate to the school, uh, the local school, um, uh, King Edward V's Community College, also known as Kevix, um, and also some uh, of the electricity gets sold into the foundry at the industrial estate. 
That's fantastic. It's, it's such a good project. So um, we've already had a question, actually, from um, 9B1 saying, why did you build the turbine here? So why hydro? Why here? Uh, because it, it's a really great site for hydro. Um, there is quite a... Uh, there's a decent flow rate and there's also a good um, uh, uh, difference in, in height because the weir here was here already. And uh, I think there's about a three metre height difference. And also we have a lot of community support. So one of the biggest problems for renewable energy projects on a scale like this is for planning. So um, we knew that uh, we would get the planning because of um, uh, everyone thought it was a great idea. And it's owned by the local community. And how long did it take to make... Um, well, we, that's from we, uh, we, Megan. Sorry, I think it was built in about mm, six to nine months. The actual construction, obviously, the planning of it was several years. But they did the share offer, the bond offer. Sorry, in 2015, at the beginning of the year, and it was commissioned um, at the end of December. So it really was very, very fast. I'm speaking with Ian Bright, who is the managing director of the Totnes Renewable Energy Society, Tresoc. So, Ian, why was it, out of all the different varieties of hydro turbine, that you chose to install an Archimedes screw at this site? The reason for the choice of an Archimedes screw is because it doesn't damage fish moving downstream through it. And here on the River Dart, um, salmon enjoy a very high com conservation status. They're threatened. But these, um, these Archimedes screw turbines allow the fish to travel downstream without being churned up. The body of water inside the turbine remains in a sort of compact body of water. So that was the primary reason. So really, it's, um, it's a mix of engineering and good environmental management. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. We, we could not have got consent for this without making provision for the passage of salmon. And uh, this is the limit of the tidal reach. From here they go upstream uh, through a special fish pass which has been built next to the turbine and which records the number of fish as they go up. So we can see here the turbines, these, uh, these big screw rotors coming down the hill. How is it that uh, the Archimedes screw converts the uh, river water flow into kinetic energy, movement energy, and then into electricity. What, what is it about the water? Well, the Archimedes screw allows the weight of the water passing downhill to turn itself. Right. And the amount of power that's available for us to abstract is a product of the height that it falls, which is known as the head. And in this instance, that's from the top of the weir there, which is the, the height of the water when it comes in. And then here, the level of the water where it falls out. So that's the head, and in this case, that head varies daily as a result of the tide going in and out, because this is the upper reach of the tidal dart here now. I see. Can we, um, can we head up the hill, actually, yeah. and have a look in the machinery room Absolutely. to see how the movement of the Archimedes screw rotor gets converted into electricity? Yes, of course. And, but as we go, we can see the water passing along here. And as a body of water, the fish are just held in that body of water as it moves downstream and turns the turbine. I see. So, everyone, you can see that we're working our way up that head, up that hill that Ian was talking about just now. I think we've climbed up round about three metres to get up to the uh, machinery room where we've got an absolutely splendid door which is uh, designed i think in this way because well this is this is um the same as a, a ship's bulkhead door a big ship will have bulkheads like this in, in, in compartments and it's designed in this way so that if we get a big flood in a, in a major flood the water can come over this wall and flow past here without affecting the machinery inside. So none of the expensive equipment becomes damaged? Absolutely. This is a, a sealed box. Yep. So, um, as you can all hear, it's a little bit noisy inside here, and the building was doing a very good job keeping all of that noise out uh, uh, from the environment. Absolutely, and that's, that's why it's got another reason why it has very thick concrete walls. 
and the outside is lined with stone to blend in with the local uh, local architecture. That's so, superb. Uh, what here, have we got here, Ro? This is the drive shaft coming from the top of the turbine. Yes. So this is rotating slowly, and we, we need it to be rotating faster to generate electricity efficiently. Yes. So that goes through this gearbox here, just like the gearbox in a car, right. it adjusts the speed so that it speeds the revolutions up to the right speed for the generator. So the gear wheels in here... Um, yes, you can see spe the speed I there. See. As that shaft is... The speed is speeded up by the gearbox so that we've got a high speed when it gets to the generator. That's, that's tremendously uh, impressive. And that's the machine that's making the electricity. This is where the electricity is made. And then the electricity goes from there through these cables to the, to the distribution box where it's converted to the right uh, voltage so that it can be supplied to the grid. And the amazing thing is, I understand, is that this electricity is going directly to supply the school next door. All of this, all of the electricity that goes through th this distribution box here is providing electricity for Kevick School in Totnes. And that one there is providing electricity for a, a factory on the industrial estate. That's, that's amazing. So it's um, the power generated here is being uh, used locally. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, at, and at lower cost to our customers. I think the building's been engineered with a green roof. Is that right? Yes, it has. And the, the reason for that is um, we wanted the building to blend in with the local scenery, which is rustic at this point. And also, sound insulation is very important. It's very, very noisy in that engine room. And we don't want that noise where, on, a, on a river walk where people come to enjoy themselves. So um, the, the green roof provides very good sound insulation. That's, um, that's just marvellous. That's really in, in, impressive thought of the engineering and the environment all being put together. Um, where we're going to go to next is I'm going to pass over to Natalie, who will be chatting to Chris about the engineering, uh, uh, about, about the engineering of the uh, machinery here. Fantastic. And I just wonder very, very quickly, did we have any questions, Alice? Yes. A quick question from Mr Croft's class. Um, can a fish get caught in the screws? No. 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 <laughs> we, 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 only, we were only able to get planning consent for this because it's been proven over and over again through a number of rigorous tests that, that fish can pass downstream through that. And going upstream, they go up through a, a specially constructed fish pass, which is purpose designed, where they're also counted as they go up. That's brilliant here. So it is actually quite good for the environment and, and the fish that live in it. So um, maybe, uh, Ian, can I get the, uh, the microphone from me? Thank you very much. So follow me and I'm going to be talking to Chris now. So Chris is a hydroelectricity engineer and an entrepreneur in the southwest. Uh, he, he runs and uh, has set up a number of companies. And Chris, you, you help with the kind of planning and designing these kind of systems. Um, can you just put these in any old river? Does it matter? No, uh, well, so, so there's a range of different sort of places you could put them, but you need always both a head and a flow. So on this site here, there's, there's a couple of metres head, which is not very much, that's how far the water falls, but it's a large river, so you can get a really worthwhile amount of power out. Um, but if you look on places like on Dartmoor or something like that, you can have a much larger fall, 50 metres, 100 metres, and maybe then you'd only need a small stream. So there's a range of different sites, but they do both need head and, uh, head and uh, water flow rate. So, and, and something I'm interested as well is, what are the kind of engineering challenges on these sites? It doesn't look especially easy to build this into a, an existing weir. No, that's right. Um, so some of the, you're obviously always working by a river. Sometimes, like for these machines here, you would have needed to manage to get really large crane in to lift them in and so on a on a sort of um uh, on a on a site like this it can be really difficult to do that so the plant and machinery those sort of things really matter often you're reusing old infrastructure so like the weir was here before the hydro scheme was because it was here from uh, you know a previous use uh, for a mill 
bits. So you, you know, you have to work out what's good, what you can, um, what you can keep, and what you can repair. Because um, obviously, if you're going to put a new system alongside the weir, you're relying on that weir managing to stay in situ and not uh, sort of get washed away. Right. Yeah. It seems like a real challenge, and I, I expect there's a lot of different people with different areas of expertise that have to. Yeah, that's that. right. There is. So, um, you know, there, there, there's uh, obviously the sort of the, the sort of uh, engineering side of it, but then there's a whole world of kind of ecological work whereby you've got to work out what um, uh, animals and what plants and things there are in the local area because you've got to make sure that whatever you're doing, you know, in terms of generating renewable energy, you've got to do it without uh, negatively affecting the. Um, the wildlife that's there so that's a real big challenge and that's why you you know need a bigger sort of pool of different disciplines different types of people that's really yeah really good to hear and it's nice you know these are potential future careers options for you guys who are watching um, i wonder alice are there any uh, very quick questions before we pass on to adam for the engineering challenge um this one is how long did it take to build well so i guess i mean typically a scheme like this might take um uh, up to a year to build or well, it will take a lot longer to actually do all of the work in in getting permission to do it first and to think about all the different things you've got to worry about so it wouldn't be a surprise if something like this took five years from when you had the first idea to when you turn it on but the actual construction well if you have a good dry summer that may be enough to uh, to build it yeah brilliant thank you very much okay now you've got an engineering challenge to do and adam is going to introduce that for you Hi again. I've got a true engineering challenge to set you now. We're going down towards the bottom of these screw turbines. And what I want you to work at and calculate is how much water, how many litres or cubic metres of water will be coming down the hill through these ginormous spiral screw turbines when the machine is working flat out. Working flat out, I want you to jot these figures down now as I speak. This generating station will make 300 kilowatts of energy. That's enough energy to power around 300 normal houses. So 300 kilowatts, 300,000 joules a second. And that is made, I think Ian told us, by the water coming down round about three metres in height. I want you to use some calculations to tell me the volume or mass of water coming down one of these turbines when the machine is running flat out. 300 kilowatts, remember. Three metres height. You'll use gravity and I'm leaving the rest to you to work as a team and come back to us in around 10 minutes or so with your answers. Tell me the answer either in the number of litres per second or as metres cubed per second of water coming down. And we'll run through the answer 10 minutes from now. I'll see you then.
Hi, everyone. So, uh, Natalie, have we got any answers yet to come yes, through? Yes, we have. Yes, guys, thank you very much for sending that through. From Mrs Hughes, we've had 10,000 litres per second, which is a reasonable number. And uh, from Mr Croft, we've had 10,204 kilograms. Not kilograms per second. I think you probably meant yes. kilograms per second that are coming through. Um, and we've had from um, Ms Sherman uh, 10,204 no units. We need units as engineers and scientists. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm guessing you mean litres per second. Yes. Um, yes. So well, how does that sound? Well, well done, everyone. You're in the right order of magnitude, which is definitely a great place to be. When we did the calculations, we put the range of water coming down through the single turbine rather than the two together somewhere between four cubic metres or 4,000 kilograms per second and seven and a half thousand. It may be that with your ten, uh, uh, approximately 10,000, you were working out the quantity of water coming down both turbines. So I'm really pleased with those answers. And <laughs> Just to add in there that Ms. Sherman has put the units in, we've got kilograms per second. Fantastic. That's, that's just marvellous. Because as you'll all have realised, the one litre of water, of fresh water, has a mass of one kilogram. And the way that I'm sure you've all calculated this is to say we've got 300,000 joules per second. That's what 300 kilowatts is, because one watt is one joule per second. It's a rate of energy. And... The way hydro works is you're moving a mass down a vertical height under the influence of gravity. And the important figures when generating hydropower is the quantity of water, how many litres a second, how many kilograms a second are coming down the hill, through what height in metres, and gravity, 9.8 metres per second per second. It's an acceleration. And if you multiply together that mass per second, the flow rate times the vertical height times gravity, that gives you a power. Now we were telling you that the two turbines together generate 300 kilowatts. So each one will be generating 150 kilowatts, which will equal height times flow rate of the water in litres per second times gravity. And what you've done, I'm sure, to get those answers is to rearrange your equation. And rearranging equations is a great skill and it's something that scientists and engineers do all the time, especially in these estimations, back of the envelope calculations. So truly well done. Just as we walk back up the hill now, uh, hoping to get questions from you all about careers in, uh, in engineering. I want to just point out that there are a whole different set of hydro turbines, different varieties, which are designed purposefully to make use of different water resources. We have uh, some hydro turbines that uh, are designed to make use of smaller volumes of water, but coming down from huge heights. Some of you may have seen something called a Pelton wheel, which is like a wheel with little water buckets on it. And this can make use of a water supply coming perhaps down a mountain, several hundred metres, even a kilometre of height, but relatively low volumes. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got types of hydro turbine that can handle huge volumes of water, but descending shorter heights, perhaps of anything between five and 50 meters. The biggest example of this one in the world is the world's largest power station. I'll just give you a second. Anybody out there know the world's largest power station? It's called the Three Gorges Dam, and it's a huge, huge hydro uh, system in China that generates using propeller turbines, 26 of them in a row, something like 24 gigawatts 
of electricity. This is generating 300 kilowatts at peak. 24 gigawatts will power 24 cities the size of Birmingham or Manchester or Glasgow. It's more than the electricity that our entire country uses on a quiet baseload situation in the summer. It's a phenomenal power station, but it's hydroelectric. I think at this stage, though, I want to find out all about careers that, uh, that our guests here today have uh, gone through to end up here today working with hydroelectricity. So may I pass over to Alice to uh, take questions from you all? We do have uh, lots of lovely questions in the chat. Thank you very much. So we're going to start with um, 9W2. Why are there only two turbines here? Anybody want to answer that? Well, there, there are two turbines here so that we can get the maximum efficiency out of the amount of water that we have available because that does fluctuate with the amount of rain we have. So when the turbine is, when we don't have enough water to run both turbines, we run the nearest turbine and all of the electricity from the nearest turbine goes to the school. And then when we have more than enough power for that, that activates the second turbine, which supplies a foundry on the industrial estate here. Brilliant. Um, another question, will you, this is from 8B2, will you build more and where? We would love to and we've tried recently and the conservation status of salmon has just recently increased. There were only 250 hen salmon moving up river a couple of years ago. So the, the uh, habitat risk assessment only allowed us three months of actually abstracting water this is from an existing leak that was built for a mill up at Staverton. And in the end, we had to abandon the project because the Environment Agency said we can only run it for three months of the year when the fish were not migrating up or downstream. Um, what influenced you to become an engineer? So maybe we'll go with <laughs> you are an engineer. Uh, well, I just thought it was something that would be a practical thing to do. And I wanted to try and feel like there are problems in the world and it's nice to get on and try and solve them. So that's what I thought engineering would be about. And that's kind of, uh, that's how I see it. So um, that was what motivated me. Brilliant. Um, another question, are there any other hydro turbines in the local area? Um, I think definitely. Yeah, so um, I would. There's about 50 in Devon overall, different plants of different sizes. So there's there's lots around Dartmoor, some that are, are relatively old and some that are relatively new. So there's a real mixture. Um, but it's surprising how um, hidden they are. Um, but the water that's coming down the river here has probably gone through five turbines before it's got to here. Um, so uh, it, you know, it, it's um, there are quite a few, and that's just on the Dart. Obviously, there's there's ones on the Teen and other rivers as well. So it's quite a few. Fantastic. Um, a good question here um, from 8B2. What grade in science do you need to be able to work with hydroelectricity? And so this is a really cool question because we don't necessarily all have people here with a specifically science background. So maybe maybe you could all... <laughs> it's a tricky one. Well, my background is science and it's also social. So social science, I ended up at the end. Um, my GCSEs... I think I had B's and um, B's in maths and science, and then I did environmental science at university, um, and then I did a master's in sustainable environmental management, and that's when I crossed over from the science side of things into the social science realm, which is slightly different. Um, uh, however, you still need scientific rigor. Um, and then I did a PhD in renewable energy policy. Um, so that was my career path. But obviously my science grades uh, weren't, you know, Bs. It's quite average, I think. There you go. Ian? Same question. Well, my career path was uh, slightly different. I, I started off studying forestry. And uh, following a, a career in forestry, I then heard the statistic that it would take five planets the size of Earth covered in trees in order to offset, absorb the carbon that we're pumping into the atmosphere now. And that was when I decided to get into renewable energy through wood fuel heating and, and then through um, 
through local government and through the formation of a community-owned company, Tresor. Yeah, and well, maybe controversially, I suppose, I'm not sure whether the, it matters what your grades are particularly. It matters about application and um, about how you do things. So I did happen to go to university and do an uh, engineering degree, but for all the kind of entrepreneurial stuff where we've actually set up schemes and made them work, a lot of that is kind of self-learnt. And once you start managing to do things, people will see what you've done and um, will build confidence. And so there's a degree of learning by doing there as well. So there's a number of different ways, but application just is really important so you've just got to work hard at whatever it is you decide to do. <laughs> How similar is this to a water wheel? We've got that question. That is from 9W2. Fine. Well it's quite similar to a water wheel isn't it because because the actual the, the thing that's being turned is, is as high as the um, the head that's driving it so you haven't got pressurized water the water's always sort of going through in an unpressurized way it's relatively slow speed so you've got to speed it up with those gearboxes and things in order to get it running fast enough to run a generator so yeah they're pretty analogous really very similar. And from 9B2 what A levels would you suggest taking to become an engineer? Anybody want to I, I can't really say what A-levels you should take, maths and physics, certainly. Um, but there, there are a lot of opportunities for engineers studying through apprenticeship schemes. You know, actually installing solar panels and building these things and doing the work is creating a whole new area of activity that people can get into through, through, uh, through vocational training. Brilliant. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, we've got a question here from... 9W1, how much power on average is generated per year here? I, I, you can calculate the figure, OK? We've got 300 kilowatts of capacity here. And if we look at the capacity factor, we look at how much that would generate, first of all, if it were generating at maximum output all year round. And that is... Um, it's 50... The actual amount of power that we get out of that is 50% of the, of the maximum theoretical capacity. So that we have a capacity factor of 50% here, and we have 300 uh, kilowatts at peak. So 300 times 24 hours in a day times 365 days in a year times 50% um, will get you the answer. So we guess about a million units, maybe, something like that. You're very quick, quicker than me. Aren't you? And we've got um, another question. This is maybe a bit of a personal question. <laughs> 9W4 want to know how much money does the person that maintains the screw and the person that built the screw get paid per year? So I think maybe talking more generally about, about, uh, <laughs> about the, the pay of people in, in this sort of industry might be really helpful. No, you know, I genuinely have no idea how much I get paid. Um, because just because it comes because we do lots of run lots of different schemes and do different things so I generally couldn't tell you but it must be enough that I'm not worried <laughs> fantastic thank you for those amazing questions I'm going to hand back to Nat no, thank you all for your brilliant answers Okay, fantastic. We're getting towards the end of the event now. So we really hope you enjoyed that, learnt a lot about hydroelectricity uh, through engineering careers and just about this fantastic community energy project. Um, a big thank you to our fantastic renewable energy experts and engineers who've joined us today. Thank you very much, Adam, for joining us and, and uh, for co-presenting. So over to you now. You need to fill in your feedback sheets. That's really, really helpful for us to let us know how we've done. Um, teachers, well please fill in your feedback forms too, so students and teachers, and that's it. Thank you very much from all of us here at the Totnes Weir Hydroelectricity Plant.